There are no ordinary days in the working week of John Morton. The art of speeding is his profession, and challenges are a way of life. But this was the toughest one of all. Morton and the Dotson team were rookies in the Trans-American Challenge Series. This was a grueling 10-race, coast-to-coast dogfight, manufacturer versus manufacturer, featuring the superstars of small sedan racing. Teams from Alfa Romeo, Fiat, Volvo, BMW, and Datsun fought for a title defended by Alfa Romeo. each team, the series was a brutal exercise in preparation, logistics, and driving skill. For John Morton and Dotson, it was an attempt to make the transition from showroom to victory lane in a single season, against all odds. Against All Odds is brought to you by the small car experts. Over 900 Datsun dealers across the country who invite you to drive a Datsun, then decide. Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin. The Trans-American Challenge Series roared into mid-season with the small sedans putting on one of the best racing shows on wheels. The challenge is a 10-race dogfight which the car manufacturer comes out on top based on a scoring system which awards nine points for first place, six for second, and so on. As such, it's a proving ground for the proud factories of BMW, Alfa Romeo, Volvo, and a newcomer, the Datsun 510. California's Peter Brock organized Datsun's street-to-track metamorphosis in five weeks of preparation, and John Morton was elected to do the driving. I try to be smooth. There's sort of a combination, I think, between extremely smooth and extremely fast that you have to define. I try to go as fast as I can and be smooth, and if I have to get a little unsmooth occasionally, I'm perfectly willing to do that. If I have to stick it out a little farther than normal to make the last extra tenth of a second, maybe for qualifying, I, I do that too. Fresh from the drawing board, the little sedan was in good hands. He has a great appreciation for an automobile. When he takes it out, he knows exactly what it's like if you bend it because he spent hours and hours building the car. And consequently, he's very, very sensitive about the automobile, and he never makes a mistake. And with this type of feeling for an automobile, you just can't help but be a good driver. Outnumbered by other teams, including defending champion Alfa Romeo, Brock added a second car, driven by Mike Downs. If Mike's car is running right, he's almost as fast as John. I mean, just really close. I think that there's a certain amount of competition between them, and yet Mike knows what his position has to be. The champion Alpha team was led by an established Trans Am roadrunner, Horst Quick. I would expect our only competition providing the car runs well as being Horst Quick. Quick has a knack for pulling seconds out at the last minute, and he's a excellent race driver. He drives hard when he's in the race, so I would expect uh, possibly some trouble from him. Dotson entered the struggle two races into the series and was far behind on points as the little sedans roared into the early laps at Elkhart. and the lead alpha into the pits, and Morton broke away to a 25-second lead. <laughs> Running third, Downs was also forced into the pits with a shattered windscreen. <laughs> The 
I feel real weak in an area or weak at all in an area, I, I try to concentrate on that one. Like almost every track, I think, has a turn or maybe two turns that I know I'm weak on at the beginning, and I try to improve on those. And I try to bring myself up to whatever I think is the limits of the car. And sometimes I can do it, and occasionally I feel like I'm, I'm not performing as well as the car is or not getting the most out of it. Morton stretched the final margin of victory to over a minute. His win at Elkhart added nine crucial points to the Datsun total. With four races to go in the series, Alfa Romeo still led the challenger by 15 points. A season of Trans Am racing is won or lost in places like Peter Brock's Los Angeles shop. Here, both drivers assisted in the meticulous preparation of their cars. The Datsun has only 96 cubic inches, but we're getting uh, a little over 170 horsepower out of them this year. And I think that you've got to give most of the credit to John Caldwell because he's been re really responsible for the whole program. And the way the shop is run, it's pretty much been a case of saying, John, this is what we've got to do. And he goes ahead and does it. And I have complete trust in whatever he's going to do. This is the off-stage aspect of professional racing, the hidden portion of the iceberg, where 95% of the winning is built into the ride. We find is that over a period of time, people begin to work well together, strictly because they have a lot of confidence in one another. And I think that having worked together as a crew now for almost three years, that there's no question when the car comes back in and the engine is pulled out by the crew and it goes into the engine shop, they don't worry about it. Nobody questions the ability of the engine to do the job. It's just a known, known quantity that you're going to plug into the automobile and it's going to work. I get a tremendous amount of satisfaction in going out on the track uh, on race day, or especially in qualifying. And our cars have a particular sound. Uh, the way that Caldwell put those engines together, they, have a, they really sing. They're just crisp. They run so clean. Uh, being able to listen to the car all the way around the track and hear John shifts precisely at each point at each corner, I think it's probably one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard. Kansas City, Missouri, Morton staged another letter-perfect race, leading all competition from start to finish. With time and the Trans Am season running out, the Datsun team had reduced Alfa Romeo's lead to a single victory. The thing that makes the whole team really work so well is they've got great respect for John's ability, and they know how hard he's worked for it. I mean, he's really paid his dues. You know, he didn't have any money, but he doggedly and persistently stayed at it. He just wants it so bad that he's going to get it. You know, there's 10,000 kids on the block that all want to be race drivers, but uh, 9,999 of them, you know, there's some other diversion or something that takes him away. John is going to be a race driver. That's the real difference. That's all he wants. I just wanted to drive. Every night after school, I just go around making a fool of myself. I had a 1954 Dodge six-cylinder that I used to just drive the wheels off of sneaking onto race tracks after the races were over and driving around as fast as I could till somebody threw me off. I thought I was going as fast as some of the race cars were going, but I'm sure I wasn't. I suppose anybody that 16 who just got their license and wanted to be a race car driver would have to think he had special talents. And I, I always thought I had some talent for it, even at 16. And I had decided that uh, I was going to do it. I was going to make an all-out effort no matter what it took for how long it took. And I've never really changed, never really thought of giving it up. The Hopi Indian Reservation at Second Mesa, Arizona, where Larry Lomayestua grew up. 
big sky, sweeping vistas, and a heritage reaching back over a thousand years. And to an unemployed young man like Larry, it was threatening to become a trap, a desert ghetto. But Larry found his way out of the trap. Dotson chose him as one of 15 Arizona Indians for an experimental training program. In a condensed version of the Dotson service course, they learned everything from tune-ups to transmissions. Then they were hired by Dotson dealerships near their homes. The point of all this is not what Dotson did for Larry. The point is that Dotson is more than just a company sending boatloads of cars to America. It's people, nearly a thousand dealers taking their community responsibilities seriously. It's a lot of small car experts who know there's more to their job than small cars. Watkins Glen, New York. The Transamerican Challenge enters the home stretch as John Morton sorts out the freshly resurfaced road course at the Glen. About a 110 mile an hour, 180 degree sweeper, accelerating out of the turn. Third gear, back in the fourth gear. And for the left-hander. Through the left-hander. Third gear, stay in third gear. Brake for the right-hander under the pit straight. Accelerate through. Pass the pits again. Pass the pits, shifting into fourth gear. Approaching the tightest turn on the track, which is the last turn. It's a 90 degree, about uh, 50 mile per hour turn. Second gear, accelerating out of it onto the, the pit straight again, or the start finish straight. Up around the first turn, fast right hander. Fourth gear, flat out, up over the hill. With Alfa Romeo leading the series, Dotson's backup car was increasingly important. Well, I think my basic responsibilities are uh, at, the, at the start of the race is to keep the car together, keep at a competitive pace, uh, keep the leaders in sight, most certainly, and if uh, something at that point should happen to, to uh, John's car, be able to assume the lead. There's just so many uh, Alfa Romeos in this, in this series that uh, even if we win races, it's hard to make up enough points to win the championship by the end of the year. So the second car has uh, to finish second in every race so that we can keep the Alphas more or less out of the high, high scoring points. determined effort to halt the Dotson charge, the Alpha team put Bert Everett, a talented independent, in their second car. As action at the Glen unfolded, Morton was escorted by a pack of determined Alphas and BMWs. charging trio fought to control the race. Dotson's Mike Downs moved into fourth place. A dusty shunt involving Lee Midgley's Alpha pushed him deep into the standings. <laughs> Meanwhile, Morton pried open a 15 second lead and seemed completely in control of the race as Downs moved back within striking distance of the leaders.
from a sure win, the impossible happened. Morton coasted off the course with a dead engine as Alfa Romeo's forced quack swept past to claim an easy victory. By climbing off the ropes after his early crash, Down salvaged four season-saving points for the Dotson effort, finishing third. Alfa Romeo was again in command of the Trans Am Challenge. This was a long day in the racing life of John Morton. In order to win the series, Dotson had to sweep the final two races of the season, beginning with Riverside, California. There was no tomorrow. Even a second place would give the Trans Am title to Alfa Romeo. As both teams played their final hands, strategy became tremendously important. No, we've got a couple of new wrinkles this time. We feel the competition's getting much stiffer all the time. The Alphas are going faster. So we've got a new 1800cc engine for Mike Downs' car, and this will be the first time that we tried this engine in the car. For the second race in a row, Dotson's backup car came into play. Mike Downs led Quack during the early going with a larger experimental engine powering his sedan. With Downs in front, the challenger sandwiched Quack's lead alpha as a wave of hopeful BMWs waited for something to give. by fuel intake ills, Quack pitted as the Dotsons dominated the action. When Downs refueled early, Morton took over and ran away from the field. The season series would now be decided in one frenetic factory versus factory runoff. Trans Am rookies, Dotson and John Morton, had earned the right to win it all in a single run at Laguna Seca. I think if you start working on yourself maybe a week before a race, it builds up to a peak, I suppose, by race time. And sometimes I sit down and consciously think about a race or think about a track and try to figure it out, how I can do better on a given track. I don't have any given ritual. It just sort of comes to a head by the time the race is there. Single-mindedness, in other words, not letting your mind drift during the course of a longer race is probably the hardest thing, at least for me, to develop. I don't get carried away three-quarters of the way through the race with a big lead about how neat it's going to be to win. but. Sometimes those things do cross your mind and you just have to get rid of them in a hurry because it only takes one or two seconds of the wrong kind of thought and you blew something. The 10 race Trans Am Challenge was decided during a go for broke, fender busting run over Monterey's beautiful Laguna Seca Raceway. Cornered by Dotson's swift coming of age, the champion Alfa Romeo team was finally at bay. In a last minute decision, the Alfa Romeo team decided they could go the distance without a fuel stop. This was a desperate piece of strategy that would gain 10 seconds or lose a championship. For the ninth consecutive race, Morton qualified for the pole position. Alfa's horse Quack parked his ride a split second off the pace, and the scene was set. An entire season was on the line. Judging from my qualifying time, I expected to be able to pull away 
at the rate of maybe a couple tenths a lap because he, he always rises to the cause when the race starts. He's able to often go faster in the race than in qualifying. And uh, he sure did it this time. He took off like a rocket. Minutes after the flag dropped, the season-long rivals thrashed away from Don Pike's third-place BMW and hooked up in a dice that seldom produced an advantage of more than two car lengths. Outgunned on the longer straights, Morton carved into Quek's slender advantage on every curve. pushed his alpha to the limit, and sometimes a little beyond. between the front runners became a key part of the action. Facing Morton's trunk lid, Quack tested the strength of the Alpha radiator through turn nine. I realized that if I did get in front of him, I could expect another shot. We raced once before like this, where we both hit each other. If I had hit him, he would have been as wary of me probably as I was of him. If the race had gone down to the last three laps and I was right behind him, who knows what would have happened. I don't know what would have happened as far as bumping goes, but uh, I owed him a couple. <laughs> Dropped four seconds off the pace by this shunt, Morton Cooley went back to work slicing at Quek's lead one-tenth of a second at a time. With the pressure on, the Dotson team expected Quek to run out of gas at any moment. Meanwhile, Morton added fuel right on schedule during a nine-second visit to the pits. now had an insurmountable 14-second lead with 10 laps to go. Unless orange number three did run out of gas, the challenger's impossible rookie year would fall short. As time ran out, Morton cut the lead to six seconds, but all odds favored the defending champion. Okay. <laughs> Moments after taking the checker, Quek's Alpha finally went dry. It took race officials 24 hours to determine that Alpha's gamble with refueling had been no gamble at all. The winner's fuel tank was three gallons over the legal limit. John Morton's sixth win in nine starts came a day late, but it brought Dotson a Trans Am championship. I'd actually felt that we'd, we'd won the race when the flag fell yesterday, and it was... Uh, difficult to wait the period of time because I knew at that time from the amount of fuel that we had to use and the amount of fuel that they had to use that there just had to be something wrong with their car. The fact that they decided to run the full distance with a big tank is too bad because the rest of the car was was really brilliant. It's the best preparation that we've run against all year. Everything except that. It was uh, one of the best races I think I've ever been involved in. And I, uh, I would have naturally liked to have won on the track, but it was, uh, it was a race that uh, I know we both knew we were in a race. <laughs> we can look back on it, I suppose, with some sort of pride. All those faces in the crowd, they only see the wind. 
They haven't felt the broken dreams But lived the uphill climb Plans made year by year Are just the plans of children Some years the cup is full Some years it is dry 